Let's clap our hands for Jesus, everybody. He's the reason why we're here. Hallelujah. We worship you, Jesus. You are sight to the blind. You are sound to a deaf ear. You are the father to the fatherless. You are a husband to the widow, a friend to the lonely, Jesus. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, once again, so good to be here at Solid Rock Apostolic Church of Ann Arbor. This is always a joy to be here with friends and family in the friendliest church in town. Amen. Come on, church. Where are you now? Somebody, look, I don't know. I've been here for a little while. I know. I know some stuff. Well, I know some stuff too, but I'm thankful that I'm amongst friends and family and just lifting up Jesus. Folks, as much uh, we are privileged and blessed to be able to travel all over the country, and we were also privileged to be able to travel overseas, and we spend, me and my family, mostly me and my family travels mo most of the time with me during the summer, But and you got to meet them last time. They're not here with me, but they're praying. But we spend about 50 weeks a year away from our own home. Traveling around all over the North American continent, overseas. And, but God has blessed us with that. And when we come to Ann Arbor, it's not just another place we go. There is, every time we come, honest to God, it is like a breath of fresh air. Because there are people here that believe that God is able to heal. And I don't have to try to coerce you. I don't have to try to coerce you to believe him for a miracle. Because there is already faith resident here. Amen. And I don't have to try to get you to believe. But you believe with me. And I believe every time we come, it's a breath of fresh air to me and my family. So it is a privilege for me to get to come back here. Amen. And also be with your pastor, Pastor Brian Jones and all the pastoral staff. They are people that want the will of God and the plan of God and the things of God. And that's a relief because there's a lot of people claiming Christianity that don't necessarily want all that God has to offer. Amen. So I'm glad to be back here with all of you, friends, family. Amen. I believe that this church has entered into a season of the miraculous. And no longer. You believe that? Amen. And no longer is it going to be a stretch. No longer is it going to be a stretch for people to have a miracle to receive the Spirit of God. No longer is it going to be a miracle to watch every different religion walk through those doors and receive Jesus Christ. No longer is it going to be a stretch because this church has entered into a season of the miraculous. Let me say it like this. You finally taken off the old wine skins and you put on a new wine skin and your faith is going to accommodate the power and demonstration of the word of God. Amen. 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 I love what I feel in this house. Such a spirit of ministry. And I won't take too much longer because I've got a little dessert downstairs. Some kanafi, kadafi, kadafi, whatever it's called. I've got some downstairs that Sister Sam Azar made for me. And I'm looking forward to that. But I'm also looking forward to an outpouring of the Holy Ghost as well. So how many are ready for the word of the Lord? Amen. You have your Bibles. If you have your Bibles, would you turn those on and open those up to Ezekiel chapter 46. 
That's the day we live in. Just turn your Bibles on. If you don't like it, you don't like what the Bible says, just turn it off. Ezekiel 46 verse 9. We'll also go to Matthew Matthew chapter 2. And if you're a guest with her, us here today, I'm so thankful that you are gathered together with us. And I pray that God would speak to us and to you as well. Thank you for being our guest and visiting the friendliest church in town. You could have been doing a lot of different things. Amen. But Ezekiel chapter 46 verse 9. When you've got it, say I've got it. Amen. 46 and 9, the Bible says, but when the people, everybody say the people, but when the people of the land shall come before the Lord in the solemn feast, he that entereth in by the way of the north gate to worship, everybody say to worship, he that entereth in by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. And he that entereth in by the way of the south gate shall go forth by the way of the north gate. And he shall not return by the way of the gate whereby he came in, but shall go forth over against it. Somebody yell, go forward. In other words, if you're going to leave different than you came, you've got to move forward. Amen. But now Matthew chapter 2 and verse 1, the Bible says, Now, everybody say now. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from, from the east to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. And when Herod the king had heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he had gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah. For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel then Herod then Herod when he had privately called the wise men inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared and he sent them to Bethlehem and said go and search diligently for the young child and when ye have found him bring, the, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also Somebody say, you lie. He didn't want to worship Jesus. He just didn't any, want anything to threaten his throne. In verse 9, when they had heard the king, they departed. And lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. And when they, and when they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary his mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures... They presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. But the crux of the message, verse 12, and being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. This morning, I would just like to simply talk to you about that dream that those wise men had that God gave them. And I would like to maybe just entitle this and preach on the subject. The warning of worship. Worship. We did that today. But what now? Where do we go from here? After we've lifted our hands and we felt his presence. I want you to bump your neighbor and say, what you going to do now? Where to from here? After we've sung the, sung the songs, lifted our hands and opened our mouth, what now? 
the warning of worship. Would you set your Bibles down and would you throw your hands up in the air one more time and would you pray with me? Be so gracious as to lift your voice and would you just talk to God for a moment? Father, in the name of Jesus, we come together asking, oh God, that you would quicken our minds to the mind of the Spirit. Oh God, allow your written word to be preached by your living word, oh God, asking that you would allow me to be but an oracle to these, your precious people. And I pray, let the gift of faith be in operation through the ministry of your word, O oh God, binding every hindering spirit, whether human or demonic. We ask you, O oh God, to release angelic ministry into this house. O oh God, that those that are here may receive of you the gift of the Holy Ghost and that miracle presence that you have in your power. And we all said in Jesus' name. Amen. One more time, would you clap your hands for Jesus and just acknowledge his presence. Hallelujah. We trust you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, and you may be seated if you so desire. So desire. Amen. I come together with Pastor and I... I've come this today to celebrate Pentecost. Pentecost was 2,000 years ago on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 where that Holy Ghost was first poured out and that sat on them cloven tongues like as of fire and it sat upon each of them cloven tongues like of fire and the Spirit gave them the utterance and they began to speak with other tongues and that was 2,000 years ago and we're here today celebrating what God did 2,000 years ago and I'm here also to celebrate with what God has been doing in this church the last few months and what God has been doing all this week while that I hadn't been here I celebrate but here although we're here to celebrate what God did then I'm here also to celebrate for another reason I'm here to celebrate not only what God once did but I'm here to celebrate what God's about to do and I believe today I believe today that if you have never received that blessed gift of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues in that heavenly language, if you have never received that reality into your world, today can be the day where you receive that reality and everything changes. If you need a miracle in your body, I'm telling you today is a day because where the presence of the Lord is, where Jesus is, anything can happen. Amen. So will you celebrate with me? Amen. Amen. In the time of Jesus' birth, the socioeconomic climate and the political landscape was similar to the world that we are now living in today. Because in the times of Jesus, It was Caesar Augustus that sent out a decree that he would tax every living human being. And through that taxation and that decree, it was forcing every person to go to the place of their nativity and the place of their birth, to where they came from so they could be accounted for. Everyone would be accounted for. There was no exceptions. You were to go to that place of your inheritance, your nativity, and your birth. So with the socioeconomic climate and the political landscape that was in the times of Jesus' birth, it was literally seemingly forcing them to do what maybe they did not want to do. But notice that in the times of Jesus, that political landscape and all of the economic things that were going on in the world that day. It was not outside of the sovereignty of God. But even in spite of that socioeconomic climate and political landscape, it was moving the players into position. It was getting the people where they needed to be because the prophecy stated that Messiah or a Savior would be born, a governor to rule over the people. Israel would be born in Bethlehem but there was a problem the mother Mary the mother of Jesus wasn't in Bethlehem so God shook 
the whole world. He laid out the landscape. He got everything ready to get everyone where they needed to be so he could do what he was going to do. And with everything that was going on in the world, it was moving Mary and Joseph all the way to Bethlehem where that baby would be born, the Christ child. Just like this world, whether you believe it or not, whether you agree with the politics or not, whether you are in a good economic status right now or not, God is using everything in this world to get you to where you need to be so he could fulfill the promises of his word in your life. So whatever you came from in this, from this week or wherever you are in life, God in his sovereignty knew what it would take to get you to sit in that seat today to be where you are but now that you're here but now that you're here he is going to like Mary now that she was in Bethlehem he was going to use her as a vessel to bring eternity into time was going to use her as the vehicle and the vessel because Jesus he was already the lamb slain from the foundation foundation of the world but he needed to be in time to take away the sins of the world so it was Mary that little virgin girl that said according to your word let it be done unto me and it was her faith that allowed God to use her as a vehicle so God could pour out his promise so now Mary is going into Bethlehem and I want to preach this so bad. I'm, I'm going to come back sometime and preach this. Because she was going into Bethlehem. You know what Bethlehem means? Bethlehem means the house of bread. And Mary was going into the house of bread while she had a bun in the oven. I want to come back sometime and I want to preach a bun in the oven in the house of bread. Is that a deal? So here comes Mary now carrying the weight of God's word on the inside of her. And she going into the house of bread now with a bun in the oven. God has her where he wants her to be so he can do with her what he is wanting to do. He needed a willing vessel. Somebody that made themselves available so he could be in time what he already was in eternity. He was a healer in eternity. But to come in time time he needed somebody to say according to your word let it be done unto me God needs a vehicle God needs a vessel so he chose Mary and it was Mary that gave birth to that Christ child but once he was born in a Bethlehem major all of a sudden there showed up a couple of wise men you know the Christmas story a bunch of wise men showed up and they said where is he King of the Jews, we know he's here, for we have seen his star. Because the wise men, they studied the stars, and they believed that every time a king would be born, the stars would, it would be written in the heavens. Every time a king would die, the stars would be written in heaven. There were signs in the heavens. And these astrologers or magi, these kings from the east, the wise men as the Bible calls them, they studied the stars, and they knew that something just changed in the universe. Something just happened. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? And they give their motive and their intention. Where is he? For we have come to worship him. We have come to worship him. We have come to fall down on our faces before this king that was just born king of the Jews. But worship, you've got to understand worship. Worship comes from two English words. Worth, which is value, and ship, which is a vessel. And our worship, you've got to catch this, our worship, why we lift our hands, why we lift our voices, why we shout, some ran, some dance, some jumped. But the reason why we worship, because worth and ship, value and a vessel. Watch now, because your worship is the vehicle where you determine how God, how valuable God is to you. Because they come and they come to find this 
this, this, this king that was born, king of the Jews, they were looking for the Christ child, the answer to their prayers, the, the, the fulfillment of all the prophecies. They were looking, and they ended up coming to Herod's temple, and he wasn't there because he wasn't found in politics. He was found in a Bethlehem manger, and they came to the house, listen, where the young child was. And when they found him, they fell down at their face. As an oriental custom, they put their head to the ground to make themselves appear smaller. To make the object of their affection seem as large as it possibly was. So they put their forehead to the ground. These weren't just men. These were kings from the east. These were not just any old people. But these were people of renown. These were people of astrology and people of science and people of intellect. And they came together and they fell down on their faces as to make themselves appear smaller. To make their God in their object of their affection seem larger but watch their worship their worship was that in their worship they presented to him gifts their treasures what was valuable to them they opened up their treasures and gave gifts of gold frankincense and myrrh. I don't know about you but if I came to where that young child was I probably would have brought him a blanket Because it's kind of tough to cuddle up next to a like uh, a hunk of gold. You know what I'm saying? I would have brought him a, a binky or a boaty or a, a, a passy, whatever you guys call them here. You know what? What would he call them here? What? It, huh? Somebody said something else. Binky. All right, we got a binky. We got a boaty. We got we got a passy. We got you know. I mean, just whatever. That seems like a pretty good gift to me. My son loves his blanket, steel, and he's seven years old, and he's got a blanket called Bluey. And everywhere we go, he, so I, maybe I, if I seen that baby, I'd just, well, a blanket maybe, maybe, or a, or a passy. But guess what? They brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Gold, obviously, was a, a representation of deity, and frankincense was an incense. But you've got to understand that what they were doing in their worship, they were presenting him gifts in their worship. Gold for a king. Frankincense for a high priest that he was. And myrrh. Myrrh was an ointment, and it was a, uh, I can't think of the word right now it was an ointment and it would be used to embalm the dead in those days and that myrrh they would put it in wounds and they would take that myrrh and it was used for the dead why on earth would they give gifts like these to a baby in worship because you've got to understand they are giving us insight to what worship really is is because worship is literally in proportion to what you give him in your worship that's what you're giving him permission to become in your world listen he was already a king in eternity but when they gave him gold they were saying come and be king in my world when they worship gold was for a king frankincense was saying hey I know you're a high priest in eternity but I need you to be a high priest in time I know you're already a savior in eternity, but I give you permission to be a savior in time. So in proportion to what you give him in worship, you're giving him permission to be in your world and in your life something he already is in eternity. That is what worship really is. Worship. Worship is more than a song. It's more than a dance. It's more than the lifting up of your hands. But when they gave him gold, they were saying, we know you're king. But when we give you gold, we're saying, be our king. We know that you're a high priest already. But when we give you frankincense, that incense that the high priest would use in the tabernacle. 
When he would enter beyond that veil to put the blood on the mercy seat so that the sins would be rolled away. That same incense was presented to a baby in worship. Why? Because those wise men knew that if he's going to be in my life what he is in eternity, I've got to give him permission to come into my world because God is a perfect gentleman. Jesus will never force his way into your life and never force his way into your world. That's why worship become, becomes the connector to allow him to come out of eternity into time and say, hey, I know you're king, but be king, my king. I know you're a high priest, but be my high priest. I know you're going to take away sin, but take away my sin. I know that your myrrh, myrrh was for the dead, to embalm the dead and for the suffering of the sick you've got to understand why would you give that to a baby because there would be a day where he would be a dying savior but guess what he can't be your savior unless you say in your worship I give you my sin and in my sin it don't seem like a very good gift to give your sin but if you'll come and worship and say here's my sin here's my failure I know you're a savior but be my savior I know you're a father but be my father oh let's just stop and clap our hands for Jesus hallelujah somebody would you just worship for a moment because God is and will always be a perfect gentleman. Point in case. You want scripture and verse for that? Thank you for asking. Revelation. You begin to read in the book of Revelation. It's at the church of Laodicea that he said, if you, I'm going to stand at the door and knock. And if any man let me in and hear my voice, I will come and sup with him. He stood on... Catch this. He stood on the outside of the church that he just bought and paid for with his own blood. He stood on the outside and said, if you let me in. Now, I'm not as much of a perfect gentleman as Jesus is. And when I grew up, we didn't lock doors around my house, okay? I was from Iowa. Not a lot happens in Iowa. A corn cob going to break into your house or something? I, I don't know. There's a cow in the kitchen again. No, I'm a city boy. I'm just kidding. Everybody thinks cows and corn, but, you know, we are the number one pork producer in the world as well. But we, we don't talk about that. <laughs> Unclean. Okay. But now, you've got to understand You've got to understand that we, we grew up, and I mean, we never locked the door. The only time we ever locked the door is when we got broken into. And we got broken into because the door was locked. That's the only time we've ever got broken into. We didn't lock the door growing up because there was always somebody awake in my house. My dad would be out working on cars. Some People just show up. We'd always come home and people be in our house sitting on the couch waiting for us. Hey, waiting for you, drinking a soda. Like we got in our fridge. And it was just a very welcoming and very open place to be. But my wife, when she grew up, she's at her folks' house right now in Colorado. And guess what? They lock the door every chance they get. When they're home, when they're not home. People knock on the door. They don't even knock. They don't even open the door. They, the phone ring. They don't even answer the phone. I say, you going to answer your phone? Why you got a phone? You're not going to answer it. And they say, oh, I'm, I'm in the Holy Ghost now. Somebody needs to answer your phone. <laughs> Jesus is calling. All right. I just felt something. All right. Hallelujah. <laughs> But no, they don't. I mean, they locked the door and everything. I mean, so I come home. When we got married, there was a clash. And we, me and my wife had a war, if you wouldn't believe it or not. I just, we just had a war. Because I'd come home all the time. I still, to this day, if you look at my key ring, there is, there's my van key. And there's a key fob for a Anytime Fitness. And that is it. And a broken nail clipper. I haven't taken it off yet. But I don't have a key to my own house. But every time I come home from traveling... Most times I come home from traveling, I met with a locked door to my own house. 
And I'm not a perfect gentleman like Jesus. I just don't sit there and knock. And if you hear my voice, you can let me in. But you don't. You don't have to. No, no. I come and I about beat that door half to death and beat it off the hinges. And I say, I pay the bills around here. And you can hear my little kids, they're trying to get the lock undone. You can hear it on the other side. They're scratching at the knob saying, I'm sorry, Dad. Mommy did it again. Mommy did it again. And I get get half mad. I know you think I'm all Christian and I'm I'm just, but I ain't been saved that long, friend. So when I show up and I pay the bills, by the grace of God, I pay the bills. I, I said, why don't you let me in my own house? So if I was God, I would have said, it's my church. I paid for it with my blood. These are my people. That's my table. This is my door. I choose the temperature. But Jesus, being the perfect gentleman, he said, uh, knocking at the door of his own church that he bought with his own blood, he said, if you let me in, that's all right. But if you don't, that's up to you. So Jesus is a perfect gentleman, and he'll never beat your door down, but he will knock, and he will wait for you to give him permission. So that's why he gave us the avenue of worship, because in the degree in proportion to what you're willing to give him. That's what you'll allow him to become in your life. Watch now. If you give him gold, he'll be your king. If you give him frankincense, he'll be your high priest to take away your sin. If you if you give him myrrh, he'll become your dying savior. The like, the like is such as if you come and you give him your pain, he'll become your healer. If you give him your sickness, he'll become your miracle worker. Do you hear what I'm saying when you come in worship and you give him your loneliness he'll become a friend that sticketh closer than a brother but it's up to you It's up to us in our worship. So when these wise men fell down on their faces and they presented what was valuable to them giving God permission because what your worship does listen to this What your worship does, it allows God in your life to be what he already is in eternity. So if God is not doing something in your world or in your life, or he is not being who the Bible says that he is for your family, for your marriage, for your situation, it's not because he's not that in the word and he's not that in eternity, but he's waiting on your permission for you to say, Lord, I give you my marriage. Lord, I give you my confusion. Lord, I give you my pain. I give it to you in worship. It don't seem like a good gift. But the best gift you can give Jesus is permission into your world. But then, they worshipped. But then what? And after they had seen him... After they had felt his presence and been in the house where that Christ child was. What do we do now after we have worshipped? After we have given him permission? The Bible says in Matthew 2 and 12. And being warned of God in a dream. That they should not return to Herod. Because Herod wanted to kill the child. Herod didn't want to worship. If you go back the same way you came. You're going to give up the location of the child. And Herod will kill the child. What's that mean? Somebody after you's not somebody after you's not going to be able to make their way and find him and see him and feel him so what the warning was in the dream that you should not repart or return unto Herod so they departed into their country another way the warning of worship is once you've come to him once you've found him once you've felt him once you've given him that permission to be in time what he already is in eternity You've got to leave different than you came. 
You've got to leave another way. You can't go back the same way you come. Because guess what? You're going to give away the Christ child where he is. And nobody else is going to be able to find him because Herod will kill him. But watch, that's why it says in Ezekiel 46 and 9. Stay with me. I'm almost done already, okay? Ezekiel 46 and 9, that's why the Bible says, But when the people of the land shall come before the Lord in the solemn feast, when they would gather together three times a year in those solemn feasts, he that entereth in by the way of the north gate to worship shall go out by the way of the south gate. And he that entereth in by the way of the south gate shall go forth by the way of the north gate, and he shall not return by the way of the gate whereby he came in, but shall go Go forth over against it. See, if it's two times in the word, he said out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. He's establishing something in the word of God that the warning of worship is. You can come in the north gate or you can come in the south gate. He was saying it don't matter which way you came. It doesn't matter from what direction you came, what way of life, where you, where you were born or what socioeconomic climate. He said it don't matter if you come in the north or the south. It don't matter how you come. The only requirement is that you leave different than you came. He said, you come in the north, you got to keep moving forward so you can leave different. If you came in the south, you've got to leave through the north. It don't matter how you came. You just got to leave different. But listen, God, being the good God that he is, he will not ask something of you that he will not enable you to do. He will not ask something of you that he will not empower you to perform. So if he's asking us to leave different this day than we came, whatever walk of life you came from, it doesn't matter. It uh, don't matter. We say it, how, well, what do I wear to church? You can wear sweatpants for all I care. It don't matter how you come. We say it all the time. You, how, what do I wear to church? Well, it don't matter. You just come as you are. In a church world now where it's come as you are and leave as you came. Come as you are. Leave as you came. That's not the word of God. Because nobody ever, nobody else is going to be able to see Jesus if you leave that way. But if you come in here and you come in the north, the south, it don't matter what direction. As long as you leave different, that gives somebody else that's on the way a chance to see him. Watch now. You come wherever you want to come. But you've got to leave different than that you came. They've came all kinds of different ways. I've watched people come in as atheists. Any ex-atheist? Got at least one. Oh, here the rest are starting to wave their hands. All right, here we go. Well, I've seen them come in as a as an ex atheist and come in and sit down across the table and say, "Well, I don't even I don't." Is somebody waving their hand back there. Is so, uh, you're just itching your ear. I seen a hand go up. I did or just. <laughs> but you've got to understand. As an atheist, I've watched him come in. I've watched a young man come in, and he came in as, a, I, I don't believe in God. He said, I just can't see how there's a God if he would let me go through what I went through, and my mom left me, and dad or took me all across. The I don't see if God was a real God that he would allow me to go through what I went through. I cut through all that, and I said, well, where do you want, do you want to go to heaven or hell? He said, but, 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 but. I'd like to go to heaven. I said, then tell him that. And all that stuff you just told me about mom and about dad and everything that you went through. And if God was real and if he really loved me, he wouldn't allow me to go through that and feel what I felt and face what I faced. I said, if you tell Jesus that, he'd make sense of all of it and he'd change your whole world. And I watched that young man as he walked to an altar and he bowed down and put his face in that carpet. And he began to tell, God, I don't understand why you had me to go through what I went through. I don't understand 
understand why mom had to leave and dad had to do what he did. I don't understand it all, God. And he began to cry and weep. But he said, I'm sorry for, for, I'm sorry for blaming you for everything. I'm sorry for questioning you. I'm saying he began to repent. And that atheist then, it didn't matter how he came. He lifted his hands, tears streaming down his face. And when he began to pray, God filled him with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And all of a sudden, he began to speak in that heavenly language. It didn't matter that he came in an atheist. The fact of the matter is, he came to worship. He came in one way, but he left another. It doesn't matter, folks. It doesn't matter even in this world that we live in now. I've watched them come in every different way. I've watched them come in transgender, dressed up like a man, dressed up like a woman. Big old man, bigger muscles than I did, but had a wig and mascara. And I mean, he just, I, it was scary little thing because there was only about 12 people in the service. And it don't matter how they come. Because when this thing breaks loose, they're going to come from every walk of life. You better love them and let them come in any old gate that they want to come. But you watch, I was there, and there were about 12 people besides him and me. So 15 or 13 people, 14 people, I don't know, I can't count. i got to take my shoes off, I get over 10. But I've watched as they came in. He came in that way, dressed up like a woman. And I'm telling you, he came in that way that he came in. It don't matter how you come. But when the presence of God kind of swept into that house, all of a sudden for a while, he's kind of videoing with his phone, really enjoying what's going on. The people dancing and shouting like y'all do. But guess what? After a little while, tears began to stream down his face. His mascara began to run. And all of a sudden, he threw his hands up in the air and began to cry and weep before God. And God tells me, you go and pray for him. And I said, no. <laughs> I ain't been saved that long. <laughs> I, was like, I, I was like, God, and I, I began to argue with God. I said, I don't know if he can get the Holy Ghost like that. I'm sorry. I said, I don't, I don't know, God. He said, I want you to go pray for him right now. So I started climbing. I started climbing over the pews. And I just, something came on me. Okay, God. And I got up all up in there right in front of him. Eyes, he's crying, mascara's running. And I just did what I only knew to do. I didn't know what was going to happen. So I said, Father, in the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And laid my head to climb up on the pew because he was bigger than I was. I couldn't reach him on tiptoe. So I climbed. And I said, in the name of Jesus. And when my hand landed on his head, all of a sudden, sudden uh, that heavenly language uh, started flowing out of his mouth it didn't matter how he came as long as he left he came in confused he came in damaged but he left with the holy god and in one moment god changed everything It doesn't matter. You can be seated. You can be seated. I got dessert downstairs. You got to help me preach now. I got new. I got. It doesn't matter how they come. I've watched them come in as witches before. I've watched them come in as witches and be in our services. You think these are all perfect people? You got to be kidding me. If you find that perfect church you're looking for, please do me and them a favor. Don't join that perfect church because the moment you join it, it's going to be messed up. So let me just speak to somebody in the Holy Ghost. Your search is over. Quit looking for the perfect church. God has you here for a reason. And it don't matter which way you came in here. As long as you leave different. The search is over. This is where life has brought you. This is where life has brought your family. This is where everything that God has been orchestrating in your world has brought you. The search is over. And I watched as the world, that search brought a witch to our service. Her and her husband, they came up to the front during the altar call. 
And during that altar call, listen to me, Anna Marie, in that altar call, her and her husband were sitting there. The presence of God began to move. And I prayed. I said, Lord, I felt the spirit of witchcraft. And I said, Lord, I said, I feel witchcraft. He said, pray against the residual effects of witchcraft she used to practice. Stuff she used to be in. It's going to scare half of you. But you need to be scared. Because I'm a very dangerous man. In the Holy Ghost, of course. <laughs> but no, I just felt it. And I, she came up to the front. And when she came up to the front, I watched her as she put her hand on her husband's shoulder. And me and my wife can both attest to this. Her nails were as clear as mine was. But when I prayed, I said, in the name of Jesus, deliver her right now from the residual effects of witchcraft and things she used to allow herself to be open to. And all of a sudden, we looked at those nails that were clear as mine. But when we prayed against that spirit, all of a sudden, her nails went black as coal. And me and my wife said, did you see that? We turned at each other and we watched as that manifested. Because sometimes situations and things that we used to give ourselves to have to come to the surface before they can be removed. So if there's some doubt, some fear, some unbelief, whatever it is, it has to come to the surface first before it was removed. But once it manifested, I'm telling you in the presence of a worshiping people of God, she began to worship and the presence of God failed. And God delivered her from her past and from what she used to to believe in for what she used to have faith in and today God had delivered her see it don't matter it does not matter whether your life was good your life was bad your life you're smart or you're not so smart whether you're skinny or whether you're big, it doesn't matter it doesn't matter what way or how you come the only thing that matters is that if he's asked you to leave different, he will empower you through his same spirit that he has given to them, that he's given to us through that power. It's the power to transform. That's why the Bible says in Acts 1 and 8, and you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. That word power comes from the Greek word dunamos. Where we get our English word dynamite. We're just in a service, Pastor. And there was a lady, she came in. And if you'd ever seen a lingering hippie from 1960. This lady came in. I'm not making fun. And if, you, if you're wearing dream catcher earrings today, I'm sorry. But she came in, dream catcher earrings. And I mean, she was, I mean, a hippie. She came in, she had her little, I mean, she had this little thing in, uh, what's it called? A cane. And she's like this coming in. And she just, I mean, just hippie as all get out. And I'm telling you, she came up to that front. I said, here's what we're going to do. We're just going to worship. And she began to worship. And would you not believe it? When she began to worship, I watched the Holy Ghost come on her. I walked over to her. I said, in the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And she did something like this. And in a moment, all of a sudden, she began to speak out with other tongues. That heavenly language came out of her. And all of a sudden, when that happened, she put both hands up in the air. She left her cane where it was. And you watched her bodily, body literally go. And when she did that, after she was done, she came up to me. She said, my, oh, my. When you laid your hand on my head, she said, I felt like my head was going to explode. I felt like it was going to just blow the top off. And it had to come out somewhere. And the only way it could come out was through my mouth. I'm telling you, it's dudamos. It's dynamite. And it will change. But listen, dynamite, that kind of dynamite in the word, the Greek word dudamos, it does not imply dynamite in a destructive nature it it implies like mount rushmore taking that rocky mountain face and they use dynamite to give it identity 
So when you receive the Holy Ghost, it's not to destroy everything you once believed. It's not to destroy everything that you've once experienced in God. No, it's to give you an identity. It's to cause you to become something that you weren't before. So when you receive the Holy Ghost, that is that power to leave different. Because here's my last story. And I want I want uh, musicians, please, Brother Scott, where are you? There we are. Okay. Because I was in one service. Is this all right? Y'all getting hungry too? You got, I was in one service. And in that service, there was a lady that came up to me and she was blind. And you know what she did? She came up to me blind and she said, Brother Near, I'd like you to pray for me. Because she said, I got a drunk husband at home. And I want to prove to him that God is real. I said, all right. Because I, I had a drunk stepdad, and I was like, all right. She said, I want you to pray for me that God would open my blind eyes so I can, I can go home and tell my husband it works, that God is real. I said, well, here's what we're going to do. Don't play just yet. I'll give you the nod. <laughs> yeah, it's funny, man. I'm funny. I don't care. It's the Holy Ghost. Because I am dull as a box of rocks. All right, if it ain't the Holy Ghost. But that lady, she came up, she asked me, I want you to pray for me. I said, well, here's what we're going to do. I'm not going to pray for you. Because for us to ask Jesus to heal is to ask him to do something that he's already done on Calvary. He's already healed on Calvary, but we just got to receive what he did on Calvary. So I said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship. And when we, get, we begin to worship like it's already done, I believe that God's going to open your blinded eyes. And when I said that, that place went nuts. That church went crazy. They just closed their eyes and just half of them started spinning like tops. I, some of them start running. They started going over tops of pews. They, I mean, they literally, some start rolling on the floor. They made y'all look mild. They literally took off running, shouting, crying in the pews. They were ducking, diving, people spinning, dive bombing, kamikaze, worship. I mean, it was crazy. You never seen anything in it like it in your life. And I even got a little something too. I did my little my famous tail spin. I got my hand out and I just started. And I'm telling you, the presence of power of God started moving in that house and you felt it. But then after everybody had worshipped, got wore out, all of a sudden they started to stop. And I kind of opened my eyes to peek and see what happened. And we all stopped and we, we, we started to open our eyes and we looked over at the lady. We tried to find her, but she wasn't. She wasn't there. I thought the Lord had come back. I said, oh, no, we done, we done worship without him. We done, he gone now. He done took her. And... But then as we got close, there was windows right by the parking lot, just like you got here. And all of a sudden, when we got quiet, we heard somebody shouting in the parking lot. Somebody looked out the window. Said, oh, there she is. And you saw her and her daughter getting in their car. And she looked at the church and said, hey, I told you it worked. And she was on her way back to her home to go find her drunk husband because God had opened her blind eye because she came in blind. But she left. She left with sight. So it don't matter how we came. You can come broken. You can come confused. You can come lonely. But it doesn't matter how you come. He just asked you. He warns us, leave different, go forward. But if you can bring up for me Ezekiel 46 and 9. And I want the praise singers, if you'd, if you'd start to make your way up on this platform, and all the praise singers, I want you to come. I'm going to do a demonstration of Ezekiel 46 and 9 and tell you why this scripture was written. Why don't you just kind of stand across the front? Yeah, you square. Yeah, go ahead. Because in Ezekiel chapter 46 and verse 9, the Bible says, But when the people 
of the land shall come before the Lord in his solemn feast. He that entereth in by the way of the north gate shall to worship, shall go out by the way of the south. Because in those days in Jerusalem, when they would gather together for the feast, it was like schools back in session. and The city would swell to from 50,000 to 150,000 to 200,000 to 250,000. But when they would have those feasts, they were all coming from every different direction to that city. And the reason that that scripture was written, because we had to do something to control the traffic. Of all those that were coming and going to worship the king. So now as the people would line up to enter in to worship to see the king. Say if you come in the north it doesn't matter. You come in the south it doesn't matter. All you've got to do is keep moving forward. Keep pressing forward so that you can leave different. Why? Because which way is this? Well that's not going to work. North, south, it doesn't matter. This is going to be north. I want you all to turn towards me. This is that scripture. We're going through the north gate. And we've got to keep moving forward and leave the south gate. We've got to leave different than we came. Why? Because in those days there were so many people coming that it didn't matter which direction that you were going. There would always be somebody right behind you. So if you're going through the north gate and there's people coming from every different direction, it doesn't matter which way you came. As when you come to the king, there was always somebody that was going to be right behind you. So if you go and you worship and you feel God and you hear his word, but then you, instead of going out a different way, you turn to go out the same gate. No, you don't. You you can't, can't come this way. If I turn to leave the same way that I came, all of a sudden, I'm going to keep her from getting to him. If I turn to leave the same way that I came, I'm going to get in the way of somebody that needs direction and a word from God or somebody, somebody that needs a miracle or a healing for their family. Somebody, I might get in their way. That's why you can't go back to Harry. That's why you can't go the same. You cannot leave the same way you came. Why? Because there's somebody right behind you that might need him a little bit more. There's somebody right behind you that might need a word. But if you try to leave the same, they might not get what they need. What does this look like? I'll tell you what it looks like. It looks like a little a youth pastor. When I used to be a youth pastor, I used to have this young this young family called the Stanfield family. They had a bunch of girls that were in the youth group, but then they had a five year old brother, and that five year old brother's name was Corbin. And Corbin loved Brother Rhino. They called me because I used to wear my hair up in a spike right up there on the top. And they said Brother Rhino, and and they'd come in. He said, "I want to do my hair like Brother Rhino." He said, I won't dress like Brother Rhino. Can I wear a tie like Brother Rhino? And every service he would come with his hair done like me. And he would stand right next to me during worship. So one service I started to do something like this. I seen little Corbin. And I did something like this. I looked over at Corbin. You know what he did? Five years old. So I lifted up my other hand. And little Corbin did the same thing. So I started messing with him. I did this. <laughs> Guess what little Corbin did? Then I realized what kind of influence I really had. So then I lifted both my hands and I began to worship. And that day I decided that I, I was going to leave different because I understood that there were some people right behind me that were following me and that needed to get to him. So as I began to lift my hands, little Corbin began to lift his hands. And I began to cry and worship. And as I began to cry and worship, I looked down at a little five-year-old boy, Corbin. He's now got tears flowing down his face. And I said, and I made up my mind that day that I was going to leave different. Why? Because of those that were watching 
So in that moment, I began to give myself completely to God. And I gave God permission into my world to change me that day. And when I did that, gave God permission in my world to change me. I looked down at little Corbin. And little Corbin, five-year-old boy, has his hands up in the air. And for the first time in his life, he is speaking in that heavenly language. Nobody prayed for him. Nobody laid a hand. But when he began to worship, for the first time, Corbin received the Holy Ghost. But I told you that to tell you this. My son, he's seven now. But when he was five, guess what? Same thing. He got the Holy Ghost, not in a church service. He got the Holy Ghost in our living room. In our worship. But guess what? I've got one more daughter, Pastor. Natalie Jo. She's little, just a little baby thing. And guess how old she is today? And you know where she would be if she was here? Right here. Behind every one of you. But my question today with you that are here. Whether you're a saint that's been here 40 years or you are a guest that just inquisitively came wondering if you would hear from God today. My little Natalie Jo would be right behind you, five years old. And my question is, if she was behind you, would she make it to Jesus? Or will you choose to leave those doors with the same pain, the same questions? Wondering the same things about life. Or will you make up in your mind today. I'm going to live different. Than I came. Because if I come. And I try to leave different. Little Natalie Joe's behind you. Waiting for you to make your move. Waiting for you to lift your hands. If Natalie Joe was here. You know what I'd say to her. Natalie Joe, do what they do. Lift your hands. Worship like they do. So let me ask you praise team. If Natalie Joe was watching you. What would she be doing or need to do? Come on, Solid Rock Apostolic Church. There's somebody right behind you. That's it, Natalie Joe. Watch them. Do what they do. Come on, you've got your family behind you. You've got, come on, Dad. Come on, Mom. You've got somebody right behind you. Somebody make up in your mind. Today is my day to leave different. Come on, Solid Rock. They're on the way. They're coming from every different direction. I want you, if you would, would you please stand all over this house? Everyone, if you would, just would you stand? If Natalie Joe was here, would she get the Holy Ghost today? Or will you leave with the same beliefs, the same understandings, the same situations, the same problems? So in this house, no emotion. If you're ready to leave changed. I want everybody in this house, I want you to turn around. I'm going to ask you to ask a question to a person next to you. I want you to ask them, have you ever received? I want you behind you, on each side of you, I want you to ask, have you ever received the gift of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues? And go ahead and answer them. Come on, look at everybody. Now listen, if they said yes, if they said yes, turn to them and say good because you're about to get it again. But listen, if they said no, 
I want you to turn to them and say, will you come with me to worship? Will you come with me today to worship? So I want you to come. Would you just now, everybody, I want you to just start to come. If they said yes, and they'll come with you. I want you to just come and start coming to this front. And everybody, if you want to leave different, I want us all to begin to make our way to this altar. If you need a miracle, if you need God to let you leave different, whether it is emotionally, physically, or spiritually, I just, I just want you to begin to make your way up to this front. Come on. Thank you to our guests that are coming. Thank you. Come on, let's give them a hand clap for coming. Come on, keep moving. There's somebody behind you. Come on, there's somebody behind you. Come on, they're coming. They're still coming. Come on, keep coming. Come on, keep moving a little bit forward. Come on. There's people still behind you. You've got to keep moving forward just like I preach. Come on. Beautiful. Thank you for coming. But now that you're here, whether you've never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost before, speaking with other tongues as God has promised that gift. This gift is unto you. This promise is unto you, your children, those that are afar off, as many as the Lord our God shall call. Or you need a miracle. God can do that miracle today. Are you ready? So what I'm going to ask us to do in a moment, I'm going to ask us to lift our hands in a moment. You don't have to do it right now. I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. Why? Because that is a sign of surrender. Like if I was to go to a bank and I'd say, give me all your money, stick them up. That says you can have everything. So I'm going to ask you to lift your hands because that's a sign to God. God, I give you everything. But then, not right now, we'll do it in a second. I'll tell you when. I don't want you to hold your hand up forever and be like, man, this guy is long-winded. But I'm going to have you lift your hands, then I'm going to have you lift your heads towards heaven. Why? Because I don't want your head hanging down low because that's shame. You don't have anything to be ashamed of. He loves you right where you are. But He loves you too much to leave you the way you are. So I'm going to ask you to lift your hands. I'm going to ask you to lift your heads. But then I'm going to ask you to lift your voice. Because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So if it's in your heart, it's going to come out of your mouth. People speak out some stuff. They said, oh, I didn't mean that. Yes, you did. That was in your heart. So we're going to lift our hands, our heads, and then our voices. But the first thing that we're going to do when our hands are lifted, our heads are lifted, and our voices are lifted, we're going to ask God to forgive us for every sin. We're going to repent, which literally means to turn around and to leave different. So we're going to ask God to forgive us of all of our sins. And I'm going to ask pastor in a moment. He's going to lead you in that prayer of repentance. Forgive me for my sin. I'm so sorry. I want to leave different. But then after we repent, God is going to fill people with the Holy Ghost. You believe that? Every one of you that need the Holy Ghost, you can leave with that promise. Do you believe that? And if you need a miracle, God's going to give you a miracle. But after he prays, I'm going to take the mic back. And I'm going to say in the name of Jesus, upon the authority of the word of God and the power that's in the name of Jesus, I command you to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And when I do, with your hands lifted high, your head lifted high, I want you with your voice. I'm going to, share, I'm going to shout hallelujah. And when I shout hallelujah, I want you to repeat me with all of your might and just shout hallelujah. And that will be the last word you speak in English. And that heavenly language will begin to flow out of you like never before. Are you ready? Are you ready? 
I want you to lift your hands. I want you to lift your heads. And I want you to lift your voice as pastor begins to pray with us. Father, I ask that you forgive me. Forgive me for every sin, every thought, every word, every deed. Lord, I know that I have fallen short. I know, Lord, that I have done things that have disappointed you. And today I come before your holy presence. I come to the foot of the cross and I surrender, Jesus. Forgive me, Jesus. Wash me, cleanse me with your blood, Jesus. I'm so sorry, Lord. Jesus, I need you, Jesus. I can't do this on my own. I can't change myself, Jesus. I need you, Jesus. I need your power, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, every thought, Lord, that's not pleasing, everything I've done in my past, Lord. I give it to you, Jesus. I release it to you. I give you my sin. I give you my stubbornness. I give you my will, Jesus. I surrender it all to you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. I need you right now, Jesus. I surrender to you, Jesus. I open my heart, Lord. I open my heart. I, I remove every wall between you and between me. I don't want there to be anything between us right now, Jesus. I come in faith, Lord. I confess openly my sin. I confess openly my need for you. I surrender to you, Jesus. That's it. That's it. Come on, that's it. Just tell him, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm a sinner. I need you, Jesus. Forgive me, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Now listen. Listen. If you ask Jesus to forgive you, the Bible says he is just and right to forgive you. So if you ask him to forgive you, I believe you've been forgiven. How many believe that you've been forgiven? So now, you are ready for the gift of the Holy Ghost. So if you would like to receive that gift, in a moment we're going to lift our hands, our heads, and our voice. I'm going to speak the word of faith and I'm going to shout hallelujah. When I do, I want you to shout that hallelujah back like you're not afraid anymore. Like you're not bound anymore. And when you lift your voice, it's going to come out of you in a language you've never spoken before. And somebody's probably going to lay a hand on you. And when they do, I just want you to begin to pray. Because all of these praise, they're going to begin to pray with you. Ministry is begin to, going to begin to pray with you. And you will receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because guess what, Mom? Your family needs you to have the Holy Ghost. Dad, your family needs you to have the Holy Ghost. So how many are ready? I want you to lift your hands. I want you to lift your heads towards heaven. Are you ready to lift your voice? Father, in the name of Jesus, upon the authority of the Word of God, and the power in the name of Jesus, receive ye the Holy Ghost now. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, let your voice out! Let your voice out! Oh, our sins are scarlet. You have made us white as snow. Though our sins are scarlet, you have made us white as snow.